a quote from uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu sort of inspired us. You know, he said the conflict's like an open wound and unless we have the courage and the will to look at it and examine it, only then, when it's cleaned out, will it really heal or why is it doomed to reopen? And as three artists from this community, we're very conscious that this conflict reopens just about every other generation. For us, it was important that we looked at it and examined it, and that's what we're doing. So I'm asking a question, why, what for? It was a futile cause, you know. There was discrimination and there was um, a civil rights matter, but civil rights was never about taking lives. It was never about killing people. This church is more or less located on the walls. A petrol bomb had um, been thrown into the church in 1983 and the church was closed. We realised that uh, there was a lot of history on the street alone and to us as artists on such a historical street, it was almost like a blank canvas. We're three artists who just happened to be born here in the bog site. Um, Kevin and Will, who's my brother, and myself, Tom, and we're the bog site artists. And we formed in 1993-94, so we're the ones who conceived and created the People's Gallery, which is known as now internationally. It's 12 large-scale murals here on a very historic and very famous street, uh, Russell Street in the heart of the bog site, which has seen the brunt of the Northern Ireland conflict and it's also seen at Bloody Sunday. That was around about 1994, which was the, um, a very significant date in the history of the Bogside, the history of Derry. It was the uh, 25th anniversary of an event known as the Battle of the Bogside, which is the beginning of the Northern Ireland conflict, which led to the introduction of the British Army. Basically what that was, was this community, the Bogside, men, women and children, against a sectarian police force. I remember as a young boy uh, being there with my father during the battle for the bog side and Free Derry Corner was a symbol of our freedom, of who we are and the people had rocks and petrol bombs and we came up against the might of what the statelet of Northern Ireland could throw at us and I, I remember standing there with my father very proudly right throughout the four days, a toing and throwing battle up and down Rossville Street and in the side streets. So we were approached to commemorate the, the 25th anniversary of the Battle of the Bogside. So we settled on, uh, on an image, it's a, it's a very known image of the little kid with a Second World War gas mask and a petrol bomb. And uh, his name is Paddy Coyle and he'd actually be a cousin of Tom and William. When we were finished with it, the three of us stood back, looked at it, you know, and said, yeah, you know, that, that came up pretty good. And, uh, and we kind of walked away from it, uh, delighted that we painted the mural, proud that we painted the mural. But where it all changed was the reaction to the mural within the community. Because this was such a talking point at that time, uh, guys were hitting up on girls and stuff in the pubs by saying, hey, do you see the kid in the mural down there? That was me when I was 11 years old. Or uh, they were saying, hey, I'm one of the guys that painted that. So. That, to us, was an encouragement. So uh, we went to the people and they were very encouraging and we conceived the idea of creating a, a cathartic experience that certainly looked at the highs and the lows of this conflict, but nonetheless uh, culminates and finishes and something that we uh, envisaged right from the beginning, which is the Peace Mural. But we realised that people live in these buildings. We decided that if we get their consent, then we could see our vision through. Uh, murals were painted with the donations of the one-parent families and the pensioners of the bog side and this, the wider field in the city. Their small donations helped us to get the paint and the scaffolding and we painted them over a long period on a voluntary basis and we're still doing that today. I remember I was standing in a doorway here and, uh, and there was this old lady 
and she come to the door, she's a senior citizen, she lived on her own. And I tried to explain to her that I was looking for her signature on a petition as to consent for us to paint murals on, on the side of their uh, buildings. She gladly uh, signed her name to it. And then she said to me, she said, son, uh, I'll write down my husband's name here as well. Uh, he's been dead 10 years, but they'll never know the difference, you know. It's an open air story. Every street corner on the street tells a story where someone was killed or murdered or seriously injured. I mean, all three artists have lost family members in this conflict, and we paint with a certain amount of passion. Um, you might think they're great, you might think they're terrible, but ignore them, I don't think so. It's saying something, it's telling the story. These are our front pages. If you really want to know what's going on in this city, on the ground, and what has gone on, then you look at the murals and they'll tell you a factual and, I hope, honest story. All the young men in this mural are the same age, and all the young men are dead. They're all 15 years old. And the largest figure in the mural is Brian Coyle, who was a school friend of mine, and we grew up together as kids. And he blew himself up in my backyard with his own bomb. And basically we're asking a question with our murals. We're not giving answers, we're not just informing people. We're saying, what, what was a 15-year-old kid doing with the bomb in his first place? Who, who authorised that? Who sanctioned that? The same people who are now wearing the Armani suits and the gold rim glasses and the files under their arm and are now diplomats. That's who sanctioned it. The young guy down at the bottom, you'll see half of his face is missing through the deterioration of the wall. That's my cousin, Manus. He was also my best friend. And Manus uh, finished his first week's wage, uh, first week's work, and he got his first paycheck. And he went into a chip shop with some of his older friends. He was two years older than me and he was my hero because 13 year olds, 15 year olds like get to hang out with the big guys, you know. But Manus went into the local chip shop or french fries I think he caught and bought everybody some french fries. Turned the corner and was shot dead by a British soldier from the city walls. At the corner of the city walls, all of this was high surveillance equipment, sandbag posts, up until very recently. And uh, that corner was known as Murderer's Corner because it wasn't the only person they shot dead from there. Uh, Manus got two high philosophy bullets to the back of the year. There was no inquest, no jury, no evidence, no nothing. Uh, his mother got 250 pounds compensation and took 400 pounds to bury him. Not all his family, but one or two joined the IRA. Natural response, like dominoes, there's a reaction, cause and effect. Uh, but not all the family. But the mother and father died uh, not long after a broken heart. Manus had a date with my sister that night, and he was getting a bag of chips, Manus did. And uh, my sister came home screaming, uh, Manus is shot, Manus is shot. And I told her to be quiet, we can't speak because we're not allowed to speak. So we were suppressed by our own people as well, you know. You know, so there was always a tragedy every day. There was a crisis. We were very dysfunctional, you know. Uh, it, it's kind of hard to understand the, the landscape then. It, it, it was bleak. It, it, it was grey. The place was in ruins. No hope. No future. And the place was a, an economic wasteland because of conflict. Um, generally, the youth was all unemployed. Uh, as I just said, with no future, future. and uh, so the thing to do was um, fight with the soldiers, uh, and uh, and so that become every day part of our lives. This church was um, in the wrong place 
um, during the Troubles. It's adjacent to the Bogside and the Brandywell, Free Dairy Corner, and that would have been an area in the past, during the worst of the Troubles, where there were um, barricades that were so robust that not even the British Army's one-ton vehicles could dismantle. So that was the heart of republicanism. And here you have a Protestant church and it came under attack. Um, stones, um, paint bombs, petrol bombs. The windows all had to be covered with protective plastic which over time became yellow and therefore inside was quite dark and, 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 and uninviting. I was out at the riots every day. <laughs> I spent every day for years and years at the riots and giving people tablets who hit with rubber bullets and things. And yeah, I, um, I, I did a lot, you know. But when they started to murder each other, that was me finished. Anyone who was murdered, it was all wrong. I watched Annette McGavigan getting murdered. We went to school, you see, and um, I wore the exact same uniform. So we used to pull our skirts up. They used to make us wear long skirts. We used to roll the skirts up. <laughs> they make mini skirts. And the school was very strict, you know, the Catholic Church was very strict about, you know, how you dress and all that. This breaks my heart because this child should be here. This child should be a mother and a grandmother today, like all the rest of the victims that were murdered, you know, and were killed during crossfire. She was only a child of 14, you know, like myself. And she did shout to me, you know, Mary, uh, I'll see it at Diddler's Disco. I was going with her brother at the time, actually. Uh, Pat, so, and then I watched her being gone down, she had a little hood over her head, a little duffel coat, a brown duffel coat, can you imagine? And she just went down, it was like, just watching, like a feather going down, you know, it was very, very sad. When Annette was shot dead, the fact that she was a girl, and the fact she was only 14 years old, it rattled this community to its foundations, it truly did, uh, it frightened people greatly because it was all most setting a precedent for what was coming down, down the road. Also, Annette being the first child to be shot down on these streets, she was also, when she died, the 100th victim of the Northern Ireland conflict. Then, as we know, throughout the years, turned into thousands. Uh, she was my cousin. So when we were all kids, basically we were almost like brothers and sisters. That means quite a, quite a lot. But it's not there for that reason. It's not there because Annette happened to be my cousin. We used Annette uh, because we couldn't paint all of the children because there was that many. But she's already represented Protestant children, Irish children, and English and Catholic. Uh, the design of uh, Death of Innocence was deliberate in so far as we left the gun intact. Uh, the butterfly was just the outline, very childlike and simple, uh, and almost like a lilac colour, a spiritual dimension to that, and uh, the cross was uh, muted. Prior to the peace process, because we were painting these murals before there was a peace process, we were making it clear to the media that when Last and Peace came to our country and children were no longer uh, murdered, irrespective of who shot them or killed them, then we, the artists, would come back and we would uh, break a gun in half. We would uh, put all the colour and light and energy into the butterfly, which is a symbol of metamorphosis, a new birth, new beginning. And we would also highlight the cross, which is an example of uh, the innocent dying for the guilty. Because in any given conflict, no matter where it is, as far as we're aware, factually and statistically, the vast majority of people that die are the women and kids. So that mural is called the death of the innocence, and it represents exactly that, the innocent. Even when I was walking here today, I, I walked past places where young boys were killed with plastic bullets. Uh, homes that I know people died because they had bronchial problems with CS gas. These are people that's not sort of counted as part of the problem or part of the numbers who died in troubles. This was the entire, the entire people, the entire community in conflict and, and uh, so we were all very much part of that. Uh, even if we tried to avoid it, you couldn't avoid it. So all of these events we were very much involved in as kids and growing up with them and, uh, and so on. Bloody Sunday, uh, 
very, very um, close. I was there uh, on Bloody Sunday here on the street. I was 14 years old. Uh, the mural that we actually depicted here on the street is a 17-year-old Jack Duddy. Uh, he lived about four doors away from my family home. Then on Bloody Sunday, I was at the march and um, <clears throat> I had to crawl out of the bog side on my hands and knees and on my hunkers to actually get, you know, get away from the paratroopers. A paratrooper put a gun to my face. I was soaking my purple dye. I was at the third row from the front and I was shaking the wires to get through to complete the march. And we were soaking my purple dye and the next thing happened then, um, the paratrooper jumped out of the, his pig, they called it a pig those days, and he says, uh, Move or I'll blow your fucking head off. Sorry, that's the only way I can describe it. And I, I run and I was stampeded upon and um, this guy picked me up and took me to the back of Jackie's shop, that's in, off Chamberlain Street. And uh, I come round and I pass here. I seen an, an eye lying on the floor. I seen a couple of dead bodies, but I crawled my way out and I went on my hunkers whilst they were shooting and killing people. It was awful that day, that was the worst day. And for three days after, there was a heavy greyness like this, a cloud, and there was a silence and a severe depression. And that was Bloody Sunday. But we often knew, even before people were seriously talking about peace in Northern Ireland, if we're going to paint a series of murals telling our story from the beginning to an end, then definitely we'll need a they have a peace mural. Well, we are restoring the peace mural with the Bogside artists. We got a grant from our school to come over here. It's called the Richter Grant, and we applied for some money, and we got it, and now we're here. So it started out with, um, we scraped the flaky paint off the mural, and now, and then the we painted the base coat, and now we're putting color on. Kind of a long process so far because we haven't been able to work because it's been raining um, almost every day, but it's been fun. We're getting stuff done today. Uh, we're paying for this restoration work at the minute. We just don't want to go back to the people again. We like this idea of um, students from universities that we've visited, so we envisage that each year uh, on a voluntary capacity just like ourselves, uh, students will come over here. Uh, if they're successful in getting a birthday, we can't offer anything other than the opportunity to work on people's gallery and to work alongside the Bogside artists as a gui guidance. You know, they bring their own experience to this city and uh, it keeps that international dimension to it. Um, we're helping them restore the mural, so we did a lot of scraping the first few days, which was fun, sort of. And then um, we painted white and gray over all of the squares and then we ended up um, we had a color for the past few days, so yeah, finishing it up, it's coming along. Like when, what other time in your life are you going to get the opportunity to paint, restore a mural with internationally known artists and, you know, to work on a historic, historical piece like this, a peace mural, so it's, it was kind of like, why not, like why shouldn't I jump to this occasion? And it's, it's great, it feels good to be part of something bigger than myself. That's really what people come here for. It's a big tourist attraction, you know. Not that we set out to do that. I think if you wanted us to make a statement about our work in, in total, I think the best way to nutshell that would be to say that, first of all, our murals are here to edify our own community and to educate the visitor. Because what we have here in, in the bog site is an evolving situation, and it is ready evolving. Maybe in three years' time, we may need another mural to depict something, and that will come. But what we need at the moment is the bog site artists to have some kind of funding, some kind of way that they can preserve this, the, 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 these wonderful uh, wall murals that we have here. And they are unique in many, many ways, because it's art from the people. They have turned an area that was smashed in destruction into this wonderful gallery, the like of you'll see nowhere else in the world. I mean, we've done dreadful things to each other. 
in the past and, and, and all of us have to hold our hands up and acknowledge that we have done wrong and we failed to do good. I look at those murals and you know what I see? I see um, a memorial to the perils of what can happen when people live in a divided society. And if our young people coming up can look at that and look at those murals and can be helped to see that this is the way we did it in the past. And we have to acknowledge we didn't get it right. We made mistakes. So let's, let's, um, let's endeavor to work at things and, and, and to work together so that we can get it better in the future. Because it is our story. And, uh, you know, you can't sweep it onto the carpet. I mean, we all lived this, we all experienced it, and uh, we should take a, the good from it and, of course, move on to the peace mural, which is what that's about. Out of it all, you know, we could have been dead, we could have been in prison, we could have been members of the IRA, uh, all of those things. Uh, but at least we feel that through it all, that we have done something meaningful and historical.